So, um, yeah, so I'm Simon Tricker, I'm co-founder of Urban Tide, and I'm going to take you through a little bit of a, a story around smart cities, and then that's going to kind of lead into urban AI and really the, the potential um, that I can kind of see in that space. Um, I'm not an expert on AI by any means, but I'm really, really fascinated by the potential of what this means. Um, and the same with IoT, not an expert, but really fascinated by what it means. Um, my clicker working. So before I dive into that, I just thought it'd be good to kind of step back and basically set out how the world is and will and is, is fastly, um, fastly changing to become um, basically massively urbanized. So this is the world uh, population in 1990, and we're looking at the urbanized population here. So the dark blue is, is greater than 75%, and the light blue is 50 to 75% urbanized. And then as we track forward, you can then see 2010, America, South America, and Europe have pretty much flipped over to become greater than 75% urbanized. India and China still got a long way to go, still at the, you know, not even halfway. And then as we track through again, we can see China start to pop up. Nigeria start to pop up massively. I think Nigeria is a really fascinating um, kind of use case in there. Turkey as well, tipping over Iran. And then we get to 2050, you can kind of see the world there. You, know, you can really make out the shape of the world. But the interesting points there is that China and India still haven't tipped over to become greater than 75% urbanized. So this is really the challenge of our time. Like, how do we deal with this? This is really the, you know, this is, this is, the, this is really where smart cities have kind of born out of, is, is to try and deal with this, with this trend change. To put it in perspective, London has a tube train of new people arriving every week. So every week train arrives and they all need to live somewhere, they all need housing, they all need educating, they all need jobs, they all need power, they all need energy resources, all of those things. Um, I think Glasgow would probably love to have more of that, um, I would say so. There's, there's, a, there's a probably a more of a need to get people back into the city in Glasgow. Um, so, so it, and, and some of this really comes down to these key challenges. <coughs> so we've got rapid urbanization, you know, I've just demonstrated that. But the key thing that's really changing here is that cities are competing against each other. So people are looking to be how smart is this city? Do I have, you know, what's the potential I have within this, within um, moving to the city? So the demographics are really shifting in, in, in that way. So the younger demographic are basically looking to a city and saying, is, I'll move to that city because it is perceived to be a smarter city. I'm going to have more, more potential, more opportunities there, and then I will find a job. Whereas probably I come from a generation where I would find a job and then that would take me to that city. I'd find a job and I'd go to that city. So that's a quite a big, a big demographic shift. Other things that cities are really competing with is obviously they want us, they want resources, they need money, they need all of those um, things to make them thrive. So there's a lot of competition um, around that space. And the bit that we're really interested in is this data. There's all this data being produced from all these different um, sources and it's really like how do we use that data? How do we get it out? How do we stop it from being locked in silos? <coughs> so back in 2012, Glasgow won a future city, uh, no sorry, an Innovate UK um, competition to be a future city, a, a demonstrator project. And it was uh, across the whole country, basically all the cities across the UK um, bid for that competition and Glasgow won it. The co-founders who I co-founded with, Pippa and Stephen, they helped to write the bid that helped Glasgow to win the money. So it was a very fantastic, it was a great project to then um, be involved with. And it delivered a number of different things. I'm not going to go through all of them because it's quite an extensive program, but half of the money went on to an operations center. So this is basically out in the East End, and it's, it's basically managing and um, running the CCTV cameras, as you can see all there, um, traffic management, and community safety are all kind of housed within this one place. So it brought together a number of different services all into one, one operations center. Also, it, how it runs the maintenance and the, the intelligent lighting system also feeds into that one operation center. So intelligent lighting is really this kind of first thing that often you see within a smart city because it's, it's new LED bulbs because they're much more energy efficient. So it's a complete no-brainer as a, as a thing to do. But the interesting thing with intelligent lighting is it starts to have other sensors plugged into that. So in Glasgow, there's air quality, footfall, noise, and then potentially um, um, some kind of Wi-Fi mesh network as well. And then <coughs> the thing that obviously all of that produces is vast and vast, vast amounts of data. And one of the core programs within Glasgow was to then do something with all of that data. So it's opening up 
how do we open up and share some of this data? So there was a, a, a core program called Open Glasgow, which started to then consume some of that data into an open data platform, then do something with that data. So we demonstrated some dashboards. There's, a, there's an app which is still quite crappy, but it's still it's a step in the right <laughs> direction, which is trying to make it easier for you to interact with your city when there's a problem, a pothole, or littering, or, or issues with your city. Um, and then also some, um, some engagement pieces as well, um, a number of hackathons, a number of community mapping projects to try and bring other sources of data or reuse of data into the program. So a really exciting, um, interesting, interesting project. We then spun out of that in 2014, um, and it really on that concept of like how do we make data smart? Like how do we do something with this data, and how do we empower others to use to use that data? So since then, we've worked with a whole host of different um, cities, organisations, and some large PLCs as well. So the core for us is really a smart city is an open city. It's somewhere where you can share and reuse that information, and it's not about technology. Technology is just a component of a smart city. It's, that's not the driver. And <coughs> to really kind of focus, like how do we make that data more reusable? We've built a, a data platform. So this is our, uh, our platform, USmart. So it's basically about enabling our organizations to become smarter with their, with their data. So we can take any data from any source. That's a kind of key thing. Don't care what it is, what form, good, bad, and ugly, you get it all in. And then if you then want to do something with it, then, then obviously there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's more potential once we start to bring it in somewhere. It's about data sharing, so some of that can be open, some of that can be private, some of that can be closed. And really the kind of potential where we can see it going, which is the, the AI component, is then how do you start to build insight on top of that data? And that's really the kind of interesting area. So we're starting to develop some sort of R&D projects around that space. We work with clients when they solve specific problems and they've got all this data, then how do they, how do they make that more reusable? So I'm not going to go into specifics about this. I want to kind of step back again and kind of look at the, the, the kind of three waves of, of AI um, as I kind of uh, broadly understand them. So kind of step one is kind of handcrafted knowledge. Um, and this is basically where you need, a, you need an expert and you need to have sort of very logical rules. And the, the recommendation engines are like perfect examples of kind of AI solutions that are up and running right now. So we don't really know how some search results come to us. There's, there's a lot of, there's some AI working in there trying to figure out what is the best result for you. The second stage then is statistical learning. So it's basically taking lots of these different models and really trying to learn what's the best um, solution. And this is where self-driving cars are really uh, operating in. So they're using you know, um, lots of different um, predictions to try and learn from, you know, is that person, what's the risk value on that? So that's really the kind of wave where we are now. And then that seems, so I think there's a lot of potential within urban AI within this space and self-driving cars proves that. And then the next kind of, in really, the next kind of big wave is contextual adaptation where it basically discovers for itself. So AlphaGo with um, Google DeepMind is a prime example of that where they basically kind of gave it the concept of, of Go, the, the, the Go board, and then let itself learn over and over again, play itself, play itself, play itself, and then it could basically be world, world masters because it played millions and millions of games and did some you know, incredible moves that nobody thought were even possible. So I think an interesting one on that one is there's more moves in AlphaGo than there are atoms in the universe. It's that insanely <laughs> massively complicated. And, and Google DeepMind <coughs> beating a human at that was it's kind of like a 10-year jump in, in AI. It's, it's, it's quite a profound change. But there's still a whole pile of work. And this is uh, John um, uh, Launchberry from DARPA. Basically, you know, the, a lot of the, my quotes there are from him. And it's basically there's a whole pile of work still to be done. So what's really kind of helping with this is obviously this exponential growth within computing um, that's you know, it's unstoppable. I think the kind of core here is that it doesn't matter when wars happened, when crashes happened, it's, it's irrelevant. Basically, this curve is, is, is ongoing. And the prediction is human intelligence by 2029. So if you think 10 years ago, I think it was today, 10 years ago, today, the iPhone launched. So 12 years from now, we could have an intelligent a computer that's as intelligent as us. So it's quite a profound change, which is really you know, happening right now. So autonomous vehicles, those are obviously the ones that we're kind of getting lots of, um, 
lots of press about, lots of interest around those, those areas, and this is a, you know, an example of how an autonomous vehicle starts to see the world. I've put the question marks because it's, it's a little bit unknown, like every time, every time you read something, it's suddenly it's going to be this year or it's going to be this year. I think fully autonomous, where there's no steering wheel, is 2022, 2025. But Tesla is saying at the end of this year they're going to do a state-to-state -state journey um, without the driver touching the, the wheel. So from one side of the state to one side of America to the other side of America at the end of this year. So, and it's because they're basically machine learning, they're testing out their software all the time while drivers are driving. So they're, they're sort of, you know, they're self-learning. So from an urban side, this obviously has profound change on how the cities are built. What's the fabric of our cities when we've got all of these um, you know, new autonomous vehicles driving around? So this is an example of an American city and it's basically 20 to 30% is used up by parking. So that's a lot of space, which is kind of suddenly becomes freed up for, for other activity, not just parking cars that sit there for 95% of the time. The kind of car ownership concept is I think going to again profoundly change. It seems like a crazy concept that we spend thousands of pounds to buy them, thousands of pounds to run them, thousands of pounds to insure them, thousands of pounds, and all they do is sit there. If we had any other asset that was used in that same way, we would, we would kind of you know, get rid of it. So it's going to change, and mobility as a service is the concept that's obviously coming through, and that's a, another core component of smart cities. Obviously, we want to make them secure. Yeah. <laughs> This is the potential of, uh, this is a you know, great clip from Fast and Furious 8. If you haven't seen it, the zombie, zombie cars. So obviously we've got to make sure that they are secure so that we don't end up with um, So that kind of then leads me on to the, the next kind of component of what AI will mean is automation. So, and I think this is, this is probably, you know, I think it probably will be. It's, it's going to be one of the shortest careers. You know, how long has an Uber driver been around? And then there's literally, how long is it going to be before you don't see that, that figure in front of you? It's going to be an autonomous vehicle. It's not that long. It's not that far away at all. So what does that then mean? So this is uh, actually a report just a couple of days ago that's, um, that's from the future of employment. They've kind of 30% of tasks across 60% of occupations. Um, are going to have the potential to be automated. And there's some list of the least safe jobs within that. So I hope none of you are in that space, because it's obviously not looking particularly uh, a, a really robust um, type of employment. And then the interesting then is the safest. So this is really the, this really kind of points to the future, that it's about, it's the human interaction which is the important component, not the task, you know, it's a lot of our tasks that we do every day are very repetitive, and obviously this is much more personal. So maybe there'll be this shift where the personal interaction will be valued at much higher than it currently is. You think how much a nurse or if some of these people get paid, they don't get paid a great deal compared to some of the other more automatable tasks. So there's, there's quite a profound shift there. I think this is a, a, a great little um, visualization tool. Again, you can have a play with it. So McKinsey brought this um, little tool, little tabular tool. So you can basically look at the, the different sectors and the potential of um, the, automa the, automa I can't say it, the automation pot pro um, potential of those, those different tasks. And the kind of statement at the top, you know, AI is blind to the, to the, um, to the worker's collar. So it's gonna affect every type of, every type of work that we um, currently um, participate in blue collar, white collar, and management. So this is maybe, I, d I kind of feel a little bit like this in a startup where you're basically doing seven or eight different things all at the same time, but across simultaneously, you know, trying to yeah, work with different companies doing different things all the time. So I think this is, you know, potentially where, where uh, the future may be going for us is where we're having to juggle more, you know, uh, we need a big skill set it's not just a case of being niche in one thing. You need to be able to be good at multiple different things. Or we look at new forms of, of, uh, of income. So there's, um, yeah, there's some I nice interesting ideas emerging with this, this kind of basic income concept um, or universal income. And it's great to see Glasgow are exploring that. You know, this is a, a study. It's quite a small study, but I think it started in spring this year. So we'll see what the results are. But it is to try and change the way that we think about you know, giving welfare money and uh, having a, ba a fundamental basic income so that you can do some of the more human 
important tasks, taking care of your family, taking care of um, you know, others around you, and the automation starts to get done by, by, by machines. So just kind of the last couple of slides now, this is really, I think, where the IoT component probably comes in and, and where we're really starting to see this kind of AI and IoT and the kind of org, org, AI will kind of sit alongside our tasks, it will support our tasks. It won't replace everything, it will just kind of support. So this is a worker and he's obviously, uh, his HoloLens type um, headset there is feeding him information that's obviously relevant to that specific task. And that's really the kind of first wave that we're going to see within. And we've kind of got that already. You know, we all carry around smartphones and that, that augments some of our tasks and it's just going to become more heads up. I think then on obviously the, the, the kind of goal, you know, especially within smart cities, is to go from reactive to predictive. We're trying to predict the future all the time. We want to predict when that thing's going to fail. We want to predict um, the, the, not the effect of that gully being full of water, how that will then impact on a city. So there's obviously a lot of um, money and a lot of um, investment going into that space, you know, how we can sort of predict the future. Or we can kind of look at this hyper reality. This is a kind of a, a, a I think a, a, a really crazy kind of example, but it's also interesting like city points there, you get collect your city points for using public transport, rate your driver, you know, these are all things that we kind of do, um, you know, with our, with our various devices, but this is obviously coming heads up points of interest again you know and this is a, i think quite a fun you know a hi, you know is hyper reality example of um i don't think the future will quite look like this i'm <laughs> worried if it does but i won't <laughs> be surprised if some of this does start to filter through you know you can see with ar um, augmented reality kind of really where it's where it's starting to go um, and yeah the kind of shopping experience as well get bonus points for for uh, doing your shopping <laughs> anyway i'll you can, uh, the links are up here, so I'll, I'll share, the, share the slides with you later. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So my kind of three takeaways from um, tonight's talk is that data is everywhere. That's the, the underlying component of all of this, is it's just masses and amounts of data coming from all these different sources. And it's really about how do we do something with that data. That's really our kind of one of our key challenges. AI is here, it's not, we're not waiting for it. It's here right now, and it's impacting on our lives every day, and it's only gonna get more profound and more um, impactful. And Obviously, this is the key component, is really it's huge ethical and policy changes are gonna have to be discussed and, uh, and, and decided. Um, you know, the self-driving cars is a, you know, a quite a profound impact that that will have. You know, will it, it's gonna have to make a choice between saving the driver and killing somebody or s killing the driver and saving that person. And those, those are choices it's gonna have to, it's gonna have to decide. And then, and then who's, who's, who's liable for that, that choice? Is it the software company? Is it the car company? Is it the insurance? Like, yeah, you know, it's a complex area, and this is all going to play out. And technology is just marching forward. You know, exponential growth is going to continue to happen, and policy is going to have to try and keep up with it. Thank you. <laughs>